Ever had a child repeat back something you just said that you really wish they hadn't heard? <laughs> Have you ever had a child talk back? And then you need to read Laura Schultz's research on how children learn so much so fast. Laura is the class of 1943 Career Development Associate Professor of Cognitive Science at MIT, the recipient of the Troll and Award from the National Science Foundation and a McVicker Fellow. Real pleasure uh, and honor to be here today. There's one organism in the known universe that solves all the hard problems of cognitive science. Problems of face recognition and scene understanding, problems of motor planning and navigation, problems of number representation and understanding objects and forces and causal reasoning, problems of natural language acquisition and study, uh, understanding agents and goals, and what other people think and feel and want and the difference between right and wrong. And that is a human child in the first few years of life. And they solve all of these problems in parallel well, it looks like what they're really trying to do is stick crayons into the couch cushions or put a Lego on a cat. So this is a deep mystery of uh, science. I think it is maybe the most fascinating question in science today. And it is a problem uh, that in some ways has only become more mysterious with the advent of some of our exciting new technologies in machine learning and AI. Um, because today, we have machines that can do remarkable things, that can drive our cars and beat us at Jeopardy and beat us at Go, and that are the engine behind countless innovative corporations. And it's almost a perfect double dissociation, because children shouldn't drive cars, and they're terrible at Jeopardy, and Go pieces are a choking hazard, and children have almost no market value. <laughs> and yet... Children can solve a host of problems that our most sophisticated AI today cannot. Uh, they can't drive cars, but they can move their bodies through space with a flexibility and agility that today's roboticists can only dream about. They can't recognize a million faces with high fidelity, but they can look at a single face, even one with a very non-canonical emotional expression, and say a lot about what that person is thinking and feeling. They can't look 20 moves ahead and go, but they play games all day long, inventing possible worlds and seeing things that no image net in the world can see. They can look at a log and see a horse. They can look at sand and see a castle. They can look at a cup and see a sailboat. So I think that uh, the challenge of understanding how these young learners learn uh, remains one of the most compelling mysteries in the field. But our ability to understand this kind of learning has been severely limited for decades uh, by the kind of evidence we've been able to get. And what I'm going to talk about today is a platform that I think is going to change everything. Um, it's called Look It. It is an online developmental lab. And uh, the brainchild behind it, the founder and developer, uh, is a young woman named Kim Scott, who was a PhD student in my lab and is currently a research scientist at MIT. Why is it so important to test children online? A host of reasons. I'd be happy to discuss them in detail at any point. But the critical point here is it's not just big data for the sake of big data. If you can only test the children that you can put in a car, put in their car seat, take out of their car seat, bring to a lab, and test one-on-one -on, -one on the lab, you are never going to get the kind of data you need to test graded effects or test the predictions of computational models. There are going to be enormous barriers. It's hard to bring kids back to the lab. It's hard to get them more once. It's hard to bring them back. You're never going to get data that gives you a real picture of developmental change over time or individual differences. And there are huge barriers to doing research on the efficacy of interventions. Um, uh, also, needless to say, we're going to be extremely limited in the kinds of children we can bring into the lab, especially if you want to test children with rare diseases or disorders who are geographically dispersed. These become heroic efforts. So uh, these are a few of the reasons why we would like to move to online testing. So how are we going to do it? Well, it's not a video conferencing technology. This you can search for in Google. It's look at mit.edu. It's webcam recording. There's no scheduling. 
There's no software download. Parents go ahead and they give consent into the video camera. It looks like this. I have read and understand the information I am this child legal guardian, and we both agree to participate in this study. Do you agree? Yeah. All the parents you're seeing, by the way, gave consent not just for the IRB or scientific approval, but for public talks like this. These are real families in their homes uh, uh, giving consent. So the first thing we wanted to do was just a proof of concept. Could you actually get data online? If we took, which we did, studies that had been published in journals in the lab, and we tried to run them through this kind of platform, uh, would we even be able to see or hear or download the data? Would parents be able to do this? Would researchers be able to host the studies? And the very reassuring thing is that for measures ranging from looking time measures to uh, verbal responses and forced choices from infants uh, through five-year-olds, we were able to get data uh, uh, and data that reflected what we found uh, in what the laboratories found in the studies. Is data noisier in the home? Yes, it is. You're in people's homes. <laughs> uh, but the astonishing thing is that children's attention and looking time was very comparable to the developmental studies. And we can code, just as we do in the lab, distraction, parental inference, uh, interference, and parents were tremendously compliant uh, uh, with the instructions on the study. But we can also see it all and record it all. Um, also, very uh, uh, impressively, the data we got is nothing like the data we get in developmental labs. It is much more economically diverse. The language groups, there are 21 languages spoken in our population here. Uh, it reflects uh, much more representative of the ethnic makeup of this country. And I don't actually test in a university lab. Most of our studies are done at the Boston Children's Museum. They're a fabulous partner. They have a $1 Friday night because they're trying to do outreach into the community. So we thought we would get a more representative sample there. But the one time I tried a longitudinal study where we brought parents back for what I thought was a heroic five times in 18 months, uh, almost all of our parents had college degrees. 60% of them had advanced degrees. We're here in Cambridge and in Boston. Um, look at and in the US population, most people have high school degrees. And that's the kind of data that we're able to get online. So we have a much better picture of what development really looks like. So our next step was to partner with the Open Science Framework and develop a participant interface and a research interface where we're trying to optimize for usability on both ends, where researchers really have a lot of flexibility in what they can do, how they can uh, 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 partition their data and what kinds of studies they can put up. And participants and families and parents find it natural and easy to use. Um, we're also committed to this being an open source, open access platform. The idea is to have everybody use it. Because if everybody is on there, we can keep refreshing content. We can bring families and parents to the site. And the more parents and families that are there, the more uh, all of us can learn about development. Um, so essentially, to give you a picture of how this changes everything, when we've wanted to ask, say, what do six months olds understand about the physical structure of the world? Do they understand gravity, for instance? Do they understand that objects, if you drop them, should go down and not up? What do you do? Well, you give babies a kind of preferential looking task, maybe, right? You show them objects that go down and not up, which is to say an object that goes down and not up. And at the end of the day, you say 75% of six month olds looked longer at the one that went up with a bunch of control conditions. And so we say six month olds understand gravity. But we don't know. We don't know if 100% uh, of six-month-olds understand gravity and 25% were distracted. We don't know if there's a real difference. 75% do and 25% are developing differently. And we don't know if they understand that balls will roll in down, down inclined planes rather than up, if they'll also know that they will, if you throw them, go up and not down. And we don't know if it's something other than a ball. Will they be able to represent it? And besides, if they understand gravity, do they also understand concepts like inertia or support or balance? What is their actual representation of the world? So what can we do now? We can so stimulate that look a lot more like this and like this and a hundred other kinds of videos testing different physical concepts. We can test them all in the same child. We can test them repeatedly. Here is a baby. This is Kim's baby, um, but I just chose that one. There are dozens of collages like this of babies 12 times in a month looking at this data, getting two hours of looking time per child instead of a few minutes. And even as I speak, there are babies right now helping us answer questions that before we could not even ask. So, 
what are, are the next steps here? Um, there's enormous interest in this from developmental labs all over the country, as you can imagine. Um, but I think there's also going to be enormous interest from pediatric and clinical labs, from education researchers, because you can deliver interventions online also and test their outcomes. Um, and also from allied researchers in fields ranging from behavioral economics to machine learning and AI. So we would really like to scale it up. And right now, the main obstacle our software support and outreach. Um, so currently, we're trying to add functionality to the platform to make it more robust for the users. Uh, we are hoping to recruit uh, a, a large uh, database. We'd like to be on every baby site and parent platform that is out there on the web as a thing you can do with your child at home. And researchers trained like myself in doing developmental studies in the lab are going to need some support to figure out how to host studies online. Right now, this entire operation is run by Kim and a software engineer she recently hired. Um, but we're hoping to be able to, uh, to bring in many more people for this. And this solves one bottleneck in developmental research. Um, but another, of course, is you bring in all this data and you need to code it. And right now, you code it by asking undergraduates to code blind to condition in the lab, human coders. Um, but we're getting to the point where technology is also enabling things like automated gaze coding. So we could really begin to understand things about individual children and about uh, the time course of, uh, of development. So I think this is all uh, enormously promising. It's a bit of a moonshot at the moment. Um, but when it comes to actually getting a picture of how our most powerful learners, the only model organism that actually does all of the things that make us uh, human and how that happens, uh, I think we should be reaching for the stars. So I want to end with a, a quick thing. Um, first of all, a, a thank you to everyone who's participated. But uh, I spoke with Kim. And with her permission, I want to tell you just a little bit about her, because this is really all her work. Um, and Kim came to me at 16. And she came, um, uh, st uh, uh, sorry, Kim went to Caltech as an undergraduate at 16. She majored in uh, 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 neur neuronal computation. She had one of the uh, only full merit fellowships that they give to students at Caltech. And she came to me immediately after uh, undergrad. You saw her child, Zena, in some of those videos. She's not presenting or here today, because a week ago, she and her husband, Cody, had another baby um, who's in that picture. And that baby is being held by her son, Remy, who is a 10-year-old. Because when Kim came to work with me at MIT, she came as a single parent. And those early years were not easy. And we almost lost this outstanding young scientist to the field. As we lose outstanding young scientists, mostly women, year after year and generation after generation. And that is in part because our universities have not followed the lead of some of our most innovative corporations out there. We do not have uh, child care slots or in-house child care. We barely have slots for faculty. We barely have any subsidies for faculty. For students, the only subsidy is literally emergency care a couple days a year if you or your child is sick. <coughs> I can't fix that problem in the pipeline. But I think that there are people here who maybe can help. Um, because although technology is going to solve a number of problems in early childhood learning, some of these problems are going to take people. Thank you very much.